Hello, and you're very welcome to the final in the series of Mobiography live shows. Uh, I'm Glenn Mulcahy, and I'm joined by my co-founders, Brendan O'Shea. Hi, everybody. And Andy Butler. Hello, everybody. So you, you two lads now have been gallivanting off around the world recently on holidays. Well, for some, Brendan was in Belfast. Andy, you were off in the sun, but you did join me last time, obviously, for the Luma Touch demonstration. How were your holidays? Do you mind me asking? Very well. well m- m- much needed. Yeah, I can imagine. Brendan, how was Belfast? Oh, Belfast was great. Glenn, it was great to get outside the EU. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know it was fantastic. It was a, a beautiful part of Ireland. And if anybody hasn't been there, the Antrim coast is absolutely spectacular. And I had a fantastic time. Hopefully Mal is watching today. Mal was a brilliant host showing me around the great areas in Belfast. Thoroughly recommended. Very good. I did see some of the photographs that you published. They look phenomenal. Did you do? You did the the special tour that brings you between the the um, unionist and the republican side of Belfast, did you? I did that uh, with our friend Mal. That Mal was good enough to, to to pick me up where I was staying, and within about two or three minutes from our Airbnb, we were in Loyalist Heartland, and then crossed the city over to West Belfast into the Nationalist Heartland. And it was a fantastic um, educational trip for me that, you know, be able to be with a local and learn about the history of Belfast from both sides and to see, you know, what it is like today. It was it was an eye opener. It was absolutely fantastic. I've, I've heard I've heard phenomenal things about that, too. I know several people have done it and said that it really is eye opening, actually. And, and as you say, what a gift to be able to do it through the eyes of a local, actually. So for Hi. Me- for doing it with you very good very good well you know last show um if you are just joining us for the very very first time please do say hello in the chats and comments we'll try and get your name up on screen to say hello uh you've missed four other live events that we've done over the last number of weeks um the very very first show brendan gave an excellent demonstration on photographic composition that's still available to watch back on the youtube channel if you'd like to have a look at that later on um Week two, we spoke to Renzo Grande, the founder of the 24-Hour Project, and who is one of our judges, and he shared some of his tips and techniques for street photography. It was a great session. Week three, Mark Fernley, again, another one of our judges, demonstrated his specific style, and I, I personally really, really enjoyed that session. I found myself hovering over the chip-in button regularly uh, through that session, wanting to comment on his images. It was phenomenal. And then the last session that we did, week four, was um, Terry Morgan who is our key sponsor, basically, LumaTouch, did a demonstration on how you can use their video editing application, LumaFusion, which is available on iOS, uh, to basically create a multimedia um, slideshow. Um, And that obviously was targeted very much at the LumaTouch moving pictures category, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, So today, for our final show, for now anyway, Brendan is back with us, and he's going to do a bit of work on photographic post-production, the last steps, if you will, before you might might submit your images. And the deadline is looming. It's only how many days to go, Andy? Uh, Is it six, seven? It's one week to go, basically, next Friday. Countdown, big countdown. Countdown is on, 100%. So, Brendan, will I hand over to you? Are you happy to dive in? Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Thanks, Glenn. All right. So, um, as I say, that today is all about the next stage in the in the process, in the editing process. And I love um, when I'm out shooting. I love being in the zone and being, you know, so caught up in what I, you know, um, my visual surroundings. And I love the editing process. The editing process contrasts very, very much with when I'm out there, you know, that it's really full on activity when I'm shooting. But when I get back home, I've got the phone in my hand and could be watching television and I'm editing. And I find it a really relaxing and rewarding process, you know, in the photographic journey that that, that we have. Editing for me, one of the big challenges that, that I encounter is knowing when to stop. And what do I mean by that? I think what I mean by it is that nowadays with the apps that are available, and we're going to look at you know one of the best out there at the moment, Darkroom, there's just so much at your fingertips. And that human nature being what it is, you get curious and you think about, what if I just do this? What if I add this? And with editing, I really think that it's about less is more, addition is dilution, and knowing when to stop. Okay, so what I did in preparation for today is just very quickly put together, I think it's about seven or eight of my photos, and I'm going to show you the original photo, going to show you the editing that I did, and then I'm going to show you what I might consider to be going a little bit too far. And I think it's a good thing to think about in relation to the, 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 the competition, 
that, you know, when we were discussing earlier with, with uh, Andy and Glenn, and I was showing them some of these images, and I was saying if this was the final one they put in, would it, you know, would it hit the honorable mentions? Would it have been a chance for winning? And usually when they look at the ones which are too edited, the answer would be no. So this is the original photograph of uh, Varanasi in India. And you see that there's quite a lot of, you know, kind of colors and tones and textures and detail that I wanted to bring out. So in the edited version, this is what I got to. So this is the after, this is the before. Now, again, what I'm trying to achieve in editing is that when someone looks at the photo, that the edits aren't the first thing which become noticeable. Because if that's the case, then the photo isn't achieving its purpose. So when I come to the editing process, as you'll see as I'll walk you through my process in a moment, it's quite minimalist that I usually would spend maybe between 60 seconds to three minutes on a photo. If I sp find that I'm spending more than that, I leave it. So this is the original. This is what I decided was a good edit. And this, too much. Now, why is this too much? I think it's too much because evidently when you look at it, it's oversaturated. Look at those clouds. Look how dramatic and detailed and, and defined they are in relation to the edited photo. The colors are just not natural. They're not what you would see with the eye. So for me, I wouldn't share this photograph. I wouldn't enter it into um, a competition because I think that the edits would jump off the screen and that's not what you want to, to achieve. Moving on, looking at this one that I took last week um, up in the north of Ireland. This is a beautiful, um, colorful Irish seaside town, Whitehead. Beautiful place, and I was struck by the lovely, lovely colors of these uh, buildings facing out onto the, onto the sea. Now, I'm always trying to get, you know, different ways of seeing things. One of the easiest ways is with reflections, and the roof of a car makes it, you know, a great way to do it. So I jumped out of the car. It was raining. Wife and kids were, you know, getting annoyed at me. Get in, get in, get in. But I wanted to get the reflections here. Now, Everything is about composition. You need to get it done in shot because you know you can't go back and have the same lighting conditions, the same composition possibilities and that. So you need to get it done in shot. But I knew in my mind's eye that what I was going to end up with was this. Because the original photo with the arch of the roof allowed for a lovely, lovely uh, reflection. And I knew that later, if I flipped it, you get this you know kind of visually intriguing uh, image. Now in the edited photo, you see this quite, I brought up the, the vibrancy, I brought up the, the yellows, the greens, the, the oranges of it, because I wanted to make it you know, kind of rich like, like that. But I was careful not to overdo it. And now for me, if I had continued with the options and editing, this probably would have been too much. And here it's, it's oversaturated. The yellows of the house just don't look that natural. And, and the edits now begin to detract from the image. And that's what you're not trying to achieve. So again, it's a little bit understated in contrast to being too much. And it's trying to know when to stop, trying to know, you know, this is enough, this is enough with it. So original, edited, too much. Onto this one, portraits. Now portraits can be hard to do in editing because again, that what you're trying to do is trying to, you know, to show the person's character. And that again, if the edits become too much, you've lost it. So with the original photograph here, when I came to the editing, there wasn't a lot that I wanted to do, but I probably wanted to make, you know, the character to make him more centrally prominent and that the features of his face, the textures, the tones, you know, the, his skin tones, complexion, to bring them up a little. And if you look at the contrast, what I was using was a vignette so that the man on the right becomes just that little bit less distracting, but still there's greater detail and texture and you know, vibrancy in the man's beard and in the skin complexion that, that he has there. So again, maybe two or three steps, which I'll walk you through in a moment. If it went too much, probably putting more of a glow and a light on him, and I think it just detracts a little. And I think it's, it's not too much, but it's, it's, it's a little. Okay, another photograph here. Now again, to bring it back. Composition is everything. And for me, when I was establishing this photograph that, you know, I had my scene set up and I was waiting for somebody to walk through the glass barrier to get the frame within the frame, the subframing. And I knew that, you know, the timing was going to be important for this. And then when it came to the editing, what I was trying to do was just to bring out the different hues and tones and colors with it. 
So this is the edited photo. It's quite dramatic because I wanted to get the reflections of the sun in the, in the glass. I want to bring out the blue of the sky and just to make it that little bit more dynamic. Step too much, too far? Yeah, not too bad. Now, the thing that you need to take away from editing is that it's very, very much your own personal style, your own personal eye, what, you know, what's good for you. But I think one of the takeaway points is that when you begin to get into oversaturated colors, you're stepping into kind of problem zones. Here's another one from, um, from Iceland, a sunset scene of this car in, in the snow. And, and again, I knew in the editing what all I wanted to achieve was to bring up, the, you know, the, the, the lovely soft colors of the sunset and you know to contrast with the tone and textures of the the, the, the trodden set, the snow and the blues of the, of the car and if i continued going got into kind of a too much drama filters with these again it's the first thing that pops out is that the edit and the edit isn't going to tell the story you don't want the edit to tell the story of your photograph you want the photograph to tell its own story and that's kind of a balance that you're trying to get Here's a scene from, from Dublin. Again, the composition for me was very important in terms of the, the graphic elements and the shapes of the windows and the doors and then waiting for a human element to come into it. And in the edit, I wanted to, you know, to heighten and accentuate the contrasts without losing too much of the, of the story within, within the photograph and making sure that, again, that I'm not going the extra step and which I'd encourage you to do is be curious to find out what happens if I do this, what happens if I do that, because you're working in the process to getting towards your own personal style with it. So this one is probably too much. Here's one from uh, the Fuji Inishari Shrine in Kyoto. Fantastic location. Again, in my mind's eye, I knew the photograph that I wanted to get. This is the original photograph, and I loved the light streaming in, you know, through the, the, the wooden beams. This is where they edited. So you can see a little bit of straightening, a little bit of you know contrast and um, highlights and shadows and bringing up the tones and uh, of, of the red through it. And then this is probably just a little bit step too far. And again, it's that the edit now is telling the story. The processing is telling the story. It's overpowering. And that's not what you want. One of the big things that you'll get in editing is comes down to a decision about what am I going to do with this photo? Am I going to keep it in color? Or am I going to switch to black and white? And very often in editing, there are the two decisions you're going to make, color, black and white. And for me, this photograph was always going to be in black and white because with the reflections, with the distortion, with the depth, the layers, black and white does this more dramatically than color. But it's a very curious thing that, you know, very often when you're showing people photographs, you say, do you prefer the black and white or the color? And it's a difficult one. So as you're watching these photographs here, just think for yourself, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer the color or black and white? And in the editing process, it can really dramatically change the scene. So when you're thinking about your entries for the competition, what are the decisions that you're making in editing is black and white or color, black and white or color. And life is difficult when there's choice. <laughs> If you had no choice and you had to submit in black and white or had to submit in color, it's easy. But very often when you're looking at photographs, you're thinking, is color better? Is black and white better? So that's it with the photographs, getting in, thinking about, you know, what decisions you're going to make. Now, what I'd like to do to make this just a little bit interactive, before I get into showing you my editing process using Darkroom, just into the chat, I want you to think about what do you want to be able to take away from today's session? What do you want to be able to learn about Darkroom? Okay, now at the outset, what I'll say is Darkroom is an editing app for iOS, for iPhone only. So to balance it at the end of the session, I'll be doing a, so a short walk walkthrough with Snapseed, which is for Android and iOS, so that you'll get um, some editing tips for both Android and iOS. So just for the moment, pop into the chat, questions that you might have about editing. And then hopefully in the session that, I, that, that I'm going to go through, I'll have answered those questions. And if not, I can ask, answer those questions at the end. So just take a moment. It could be that I want to, you know, how to um, kind of get detail and definition and highlights. What do I do with shadows? What about saturation? Just give you a moment to think about those and I'll get set up here with moving into darkroom. 
Okay, so Darkroom, what I love about Darkroom is that it is a fantastic app that is really, really well designed and it's designed by photographers for photographers. And I think that one of the great things about it is that it's constantly getting updates and it really shows that the you know, the photographers that are the designers behind it care about the, the app. They care about the people who are who are using it. And it's constantly, you know, being improved upon. You can also get it as a desktop version for Mac, which is fantastic. You can also have it on your iPad. And you can not only just edit photographs, you can also edit videos. And it is fantastic. Fantastic app. So as you listen throughout the session this afternoon, you need to pay attention because at the end of the session, we're going to have some prizes, some giveaways, and you don't want to miss out on that. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do when we come into the app, okay, is we're going to come to settings and settings is on the top left hand corner. So just tap on settings and it brings you into the options that you have. Now, there's so many there, but the ones that we're going to draw your attention to is the export options. When I tap on export options, you want to make sure that you're exporting the file size at the maximum possibility. So I usually have it at JPEG 100%. Okay. You've also got the option for a watermark. Now, I tend not to use those. I don't see any point in it because, you know, if people want to use, steal your image, they're going to steal it and they'll be able to get rid of the watermark very easily. But what you can do, and I like it on Darkroom, is that you can add metadata to your image. You see it down here, copyright metadata. So you can put in the image that you, that, the information that you want, and that's hard baked into the EXIF data. It just gives that added little bit of security. Back to the settings. And the next one that I would, would work on, draw your attention to, is appearance. And I always keep it on dark because I think that when you're editing photographs, having your image with a dark background makes it easier to see, well, for me anyway. And then you see here, they give you so many icons options, okay? It's not like other apps that you just got that one icon, you don't like it. So you can choose whichever ones you, 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 you want um, from it. Good stuff. So when we come in to select our images, Darkroom organizes it really, really well. All your images are there once you pull them up, okay? And that it will come in with your range of folders that you have, okay? So like recent, favorites, edited photographs, etc. Then it comes to albums. And I have this one prepared, sorry. Okay, why is it doing this to me? Let me just see. Okay, I have this one prepared um, today for photographs that I'm going to demo on what I like to do when, when I'm editing. So the first photograph I'm going to pull up is one that I shot last week in Belfast when I was out with uh, Mal on the tour. I learned that Line of Duty was filmed in Belfast, which I hadn't known. I'd watched the full series, but didn't know that the tunnel scenes all are in Belfast and other locations as well. Now, I love the street art in, in Belfast. And this photograph here, the central point I'm focusing on is the guy looking down. And then I was taking multiple photographs of passersby with it. Now, when you come in to Snapseed, if you look at the bottom row of icons, and we're looking at the one in the bottom left, the crop icon. And when you come in here, Darkroom has got really powerful um, tools at your disposal. It's also great in this one because it's got haptic feedback so that when you touch the slider at the bottom, you see it here for straightening, that you're getting haptic feedback on the app, on, 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 on the changes. So you're trying to get it you know, straighten it up as, as, as you would for the, for the image. Now, as I'm doing this, you're going to have to bear with me because I'm looking at my own screen. So we'll straighten it like this. You also then have options for cropping and you would have all the, the, the various ones that you might need for, you know, posting to Instagram or, you know, depending on your own preferences as you're going through it. I'll usually keep it as shot as, as original, as shot. Okay. I, also got tools to the right and left, which allow me to change the perspective. Okay, so because I shot this at from a lower to higher, that I can bring the, the mural a little closer to me using the perspective tool on the right. Similarly, the one on the left allows me to bring the image in a little bit closer. So again, if you're shooting with architecture, it's a really useful tool that you have here. Okay, we click done on that. 
Now, here when you're getting into all the choices, and again, as I said to you, for me in my editing process, less is more. What I'm trying to achieve here with this image is I really want to bring out the, the colors and I want to, you know, to work on the highlights and the contrast so that the image just becomes a little bit more, you know, kind of vibrant with it. Now, one of the things that I might start with very often is that I'd look at the filters, okay? Now, Darkroom is going to give you a whole range of filters. You've got their own ones. You've got cinematic. You've got instant. You've got X-Pro. And you see that very often these are like film simulation uh, filters. They'll give an old film look to the image. You've got landscapes, portraits, black and white, and duotone. Now, I have the full paid version. On the free version, you don't have as many filters, okay? But stay tuned for the end. Let's see how we can do, do what we can do with that. Okay, so I might just you know begin to flick through the filters and just see what they what what they do. Okay, and it's just giving me you know options and trying to give me different visual information as guidelines as to what direction I might like to go with. Okay, so invariably I click through all the filters and I'll swipe back to original because I like to have more control over the images. And what I would do then, okay, is I would go into the tune image slider right next to the filters. So you touch that and up pops the menu for brightness, contrast, clarity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we'll just step back for a moment back to the filters. One of the reasons that I don't like the filters is because they're applying a preset to the image and I like to have more control. However, if I did choose a filter and I double tap on it, I'm able then to decide how strong are you know the effect of the filter. I could have it very, very weak in terms of strength, or I could have the full, full filter. Okay. We'll come back out, we, we, we won't take it. So usually that if I do choose a filter, I'll try to get a little bit more control over the look. Now we're coming into the sliders. Basically, what we're get, going to work on here is how we're going to adjust our photograph. And here, what I tend to do is, it's a compare and contrast throughout the process. And how I do it is I'm swiping to the right to increase, swiping to the left to decrease, and I'm seeing the effect it has on the photo. Now for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna demonstrate one of the great gestures that Snapseed has, or that Darkroom has. And this gesture is the compare and contrast gesture. So throughout the editing process, you want to know about what did my image look like and what is it now? And to do that, what you're going to do is you're going to touch and hold. This is what it was. And then you're going to release. This is what it is. So I find that in my editing process, I'm touching and holding throughout to do the compare and contrast as I'm going through with the brightness, you know, making the contrast with it. Here's another little uh, tip for you. I tend, you know, rarely to brighten images. I usually find that particularly with, you know, smartphone images, you're darkening. You bring it down just a little. And you see that you've got your minus 10, so it's going from minus 100 to a plus 100. And in terms of range, I'm usually maybe minus 20, plus 20, never much more than that. With contrast, Again, if you look at it, I'm going to do it to extremes for demonstration purposes. If I go right to the end here, okay, and here's another little trick for you. If you do a pinch, you're allowed, you can zoom in, okay? So pinch out to zoom in. To bring it back to the original image, double tap. Okay, so I'll do that again. So I'm zooming in. And I'm able to navigate around by touching and holding. So if you look here, so I've dramatically brought up the contrast. Now it's very, it's harsh, it's dramatic. It does a lot of detail and definition. If I decrease the contrast, it becomes flat and, you know, smooth and it loses, you know, kind of tension within it. So I find with contrast, I'm usually increasing contrast, you know. And again, as I said, zero to plus 20. Next one, clarity. And let, let's look what it, it's doing. So if I decrease it, ooh, we're losing definition. We're losing detail. I increase it, okay? And the opposite is happening. It's becoming you know, clearer, more defined, more detailed. But again, you don't want your edits to be too noticeable. So with clarity, 
probably again you're bringing it up maybe plus 15 plus 16 17. now highlights highlights are the bright part of your image so if we look at the bright part of the image here and we'll see this later in the landscape photograph when we go to edit that when we increase the highlights it's going to blow them it's going to make them very very white if we pull them back we begin to get some definition into the bright parts of the image now this image because there's not a lot of kind of details and clouds and that we're not beginning to see it but you can see some in his face appearing here remember what i said touch and hold this is what it was this was a, what it is so we probably pull the highlights back maybe about minus 20 or so now shadows are the dark parts of your image and for demonstration purpose if i increase them you see what's happening we're bringing up all the information within the dark parts of the image now i find because you're shooting in jpeg and that the information stored in the shadows to reclaim it really doesn't work that well with it i tend with shadows just to decrease the shadows a little and again touch and hold this is what it was this is what it is bring it down whites now the whites are going to be the bright parts of the image now again because we want to make it more visually prominent we want him to be more piercing with it we probably are going to bring the whites down okay the blacks are going to be the dark parts of the image so if we go increase we're going to make it brighter again bring it back down a little and throughout the process touching and holding this is what it was this is what it is so to, to do that you touch and hold and release saturation now saturation boom we're destroying the image if we increase it up to 100. now for me saturation i leave it completely alone i don't touch it i don't go near very very rarely do i and if i do i might bring it up to maybe just three four maximum maximum vibrance and we're getting into you know the the warmth and the and and to tones of the colors and again this is personal taste bringing it up and seeing what happens with it okay i tend to you know keep the, these to a minimum a tint now i'm not going to want to get into tints between greens and purples okay that because i would probably do that maybe in landscape images at sunsets but for street images no i want it to look like what, what it was next one fade which gives it kind of like a film you know look to it tend to leave that one alone as well depending on the image grain do you want to have kind of grain on your shots like the old you know film ones that would have it then the next one, vignette. And vignette, what it's going to do is that it's going to have a brighter center and then what's outside the center is going to be darkened. And it can be very good to bring, you know, your, your view, your, oh God, right, into the center part of the, um, of the image. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening here. Okay. Sorry about this. All right. And back over quick time. All right. Um, got a little bit of a problem in that I can't see my phone, my, my photograph on the screen. Okay. Let's okay, say let's it's address address it. It. We had, um, had um, great fun last week. Oh, I can hear myself by That's good. Uh, okay. So let's just double check exactly where we're at, Brendan. Quick time is still active, is it? Yeah. But I, what's on my phone, I don't see on the on the screen. Okay, let's do a reset. So just pull the phone and replug it. Last week, guys, in case you were on that session, we had a computer shut down in the middle of a demonstration on poor Terry Morgan. So that, that was quite a fun, fun challenge to try and rectify. Involved a little bit of creative editing in the uh, republished version, but hopefully we'll be able to fix this relatively quickly. Is it come back, Brandon? Yeah, I should be back. It's, uh, I should be back. Let me just, I just killed the keynote so that maybe that should make it. No, that's not what I want. No, as well. I don't know why Chrome has come up. It's okay. All right. Um, okay, we'll try again. And quick note has disappeared. All right. Yeah, these so, things happen. These, 100%. It's all live. Uh, worst things have happened. Remember, it could be a two-year-old coming in half naked into the background of the shot, and it could be a viral okay. hit. We're, we're, we're back again. Okay. Okay, so we're back on the editing, and I was saying about the vignette. And the vignette, what it's going to do, okay, turn it this way, maybe give it a With the vignette, it's going to give a darker border to everything which is in the center of the photograph. And you see, as I'm increasing it here, we're getting it more visually prominent. So now that there's the, the border distractions 
aren't as you know prominent as they were before probably bring it down a little bit more now the next thing here with sharpness and one of the telltale signs of images that are over edited very often is sharpness and i tend to leave this one alone coming down in the in the, the colors and tones with the highlights and shadows again probably would leave that alone so this is what it is and this is what it is now this is what it was touch and hold and this is what it is now okay so again you're beginning to see that what i've done is that the colors are more dramatic that there's more contrast and the detail and the definition with it now to turn it over one of the next ones that you see here next to the sliders is the one which is curves now with curves curves are going to work on the tonality of the image and that i find that sometimes when i'm coming in my editing process sometimes i might jump to curves first and just try to create a little s okay so an S shape here, just, and what it will do is just give you a little bit more drama and detail in it. But curves can be quite advanced um, with, with, with images, and again, it's experimentation with it. I, try, I tend to keep things simple. I come in as the process goes through. Don't, do, don't use um, filters, okay? And then in the sliders, I'm just going through it. Right, I keep getting the, this notification. Now, the next thing that, come to, that I like a lot with, with Darkroom is that when you're preparing your images for Instagram, very often to have a nice looking grid, you'll have these white borders that you'll see on people's Instagram grids. And Darkroom makes it so easy. So you see here that at the, at the end, we've got all these different options. So you've got a 1-1, one, one, you've got a 4-5, 5, 5-4, five, 9-16, and that you can increase the border in the, uh, the extent that you want. Brendan. And then you've got a whole range of different colors that you want um, on them. So for posting to Instagram, this is a really good way to, to have it. Now for the competition entry, I wouldn't put a border on your, on your images, okay? Now, the next thing we're looking at is saving, how to export the image. So you come to Brendan. the top right. Brendan. Yeah. Hold up a second. Yeah. Oh, your screen has frozen. I've taken it off, actually, because that same message that came up, it seems to be an error on your Mac, not on your phone. And the Mac seems to be running out of virtual memory. So it's popping up the screen saying you need to shut something down. There's something taking up 55 gigs of storage. I don't know what it is. but I Yeah, think all, all I have running is Firefox and uh, QuickTime. All right, okay. I know, it seems I know why notes. It seems to have gone back to quick time again now. Let me just try it one more time and see if we get a live picture of it. Okay. Uh, can you just move the screen or touch something so I can see if it's live? Yeah. Not seeing any activity on it at all. It just seems to be frozen. Okay. Well, uh, let me disconnect and connect again. Yeah, try and reshare it again. Folks, we're using a, an application called StreamYard, which is, it's all online. And when it works, it is absolutely fantastic. And I used this um, last year for the Mobile Creator Summit, where we did like eight hours of live shows per day, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but it is very, very heavy on the processor on computers. Hence why last week, Terry's computer, which is a MacBook Pro, actually overheated. Um, so you really do need uh, to have a lot of available RAM and uh, a pretty powerful Mac. Uh, and so it's not an uncommon issue, unfortunately, but please do bear with us. It, it, it says to me Firefox is using 55 gig of memory. Yeah, so that, that, that's 100% of your <laughs> of stream there. There's nothing else open in Firefox at the minute, is there? Just that one window? No, just, just that, yeah. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, Elaine, actually. Yeah, time to have a quick play with Darkroom yourself while we're just trying to get this sorted. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, can, uh, can, you, can you see um, my screen again? I will add it now, one second. It seems to be still on that same freeze frame where we have borders and, uh, yeah, I would say quit the share and uh, try and reshare. Or did you do that already? I did all that, yeah. I've taken it off and I've closed QuickTime and opened QuickTime and um, stopped sharing. It's, but it's Firefox is taking 55 gig of memory. Okay, so what I might, I uh, can't really take you out. I, I, I'm worried that if I hit the kick from studio button, which is like a big red button, then I'm going to remove you from the live stream as well, because obviously both are coming from you. The screen has gone black now, Brendan. So do you want to try and reshare? Um, I've got the beach ball of doom. Oh, wow. Okay, folks. So worst case scenario, Brendan's Mac is now going to go into the same sleep mode as happened with Terry last week. It may not. He may be able to stay with us, but obviously being able to demo um, the 
you know, the app is, is super important for today's session. So, Brendan, do you know what might be the best thing to do is I'm going to step you potentially off screen and I'd ask you to try and restart your Mac. Do a full shutdown and restart. Emergency procedure number one, as they used to call it when I was working as a broadcast engineer. And you'd be surprised how often that actually works. Yeah, you've frozen. So um, hopefully he heard that message before we lose him. But anyway, so what we were also going to do in today's show after the demonstration part was to talk a little bit about the actual um, submissions that we've had so far. And I think probably now would be a good time to maybe bump that up the priority. <laughs> <laughs> Move to plan B. Great technology when the technology works, but the problem is, you know, um, it, it, it does have its challenges at times as well. It, it all depends on good broadband and all the rest of it. Um, so will we talk a little bit about the actual the submissions that have come in? Because, like, you know, we're one week out. We have seen some amazing shots. You've been sharing them on your Instagram channel. Um, we we put a little video together. I don't know if it's – should we play it or what do you think, Andy? Well, um. I mean, this week's been uh, a busy week uh, with them coming in. Um, and, yeah, we, we, we're one week out now, so um, next Friday is the deadline. Uh, one thing I would say is uh, that the submission process is to complete the submission, uh, you need to complete the entropy part of that process. Otherwise, come the deadline, the uh, submissions that you send through won't be counted. So that, that, that's one thing that a few people are missing. Um, as I say, we're one week out. Uh, we have five categories, uh, which we deliberately kept limited but broad um, for this first awards. Uh, they are street and urban, which can cover topics such as street photography, urban streets, landscapes, even, I suppose, uh, the home might be included. You could you could uh, include that in there. Uh, we've got landscape and nature, uh, which obviously covers such things as landscape and seascape, vistas, animals, insects, flowers, uh, macro photography, people and portraiture, which I think is fairly self-explanatory. Um, selfies, I suppose, will be included in there as well and the digital art category, which uh, I've had a few questions about that over the past sort of week or so. Um, and I suppose digital art can meet, mean different things to different people. Uh, for me, uh, digital art is using images that can be manipulated to create something that is uh, interesting and abstract. It can be something as simple as a double exposure. Uh, it could be something more complex as multiple layering of images to composite in uh, something using um, uh, superimpose or icolorama, um, using uh, getting abstract effects using slow shutter cam um, to create something that really wouldn't look out of place in an art gallery. And then finally, the last category we have is the LumaTouch moving pictures category which um, is we're asking people to create um, a short 30 second to two minute video of a series of still images that tell a story and can be mixed in with audio video time lapse text uh, but the key thing is that it is edited uh, on a video editing app such as LumaFusion or iMovie yeah, perfect. Very good. Well, we did show an example of one of the entries for the um, moving pictures category last week. Uh, that was a piece from Rob Layton. It was pretty stunning. Um, we have prepped a presentation with just, a, I think there's about 40 images in it. But Brendan has just popped back up onto my green room feed down here. So I'm going to bring him back in. Hello, sir. Hey, Glenn. Yeah, look, sorry about that. I'm not sure why, you know, a brand new MacBook Pro is have, having memory drain on Firefox 55 gig, but... I'm back. Hopefully we can run through and there won't be any more uh, tech hiccups. And thanks for the patience and thanks for the two of you jumping in to keep the show on the road. No bother. We'll save the slideshow then for, for a minute or two. But um, I'm not seeing the screen share yet, Brendan. Are you sharing there for me, are you? Um, I thought I was. Let me just check again. Yeah, okay. This is Can you see it? It's looking promising. Let's get it back up on screen. Make sure it works. All right. Do a quick I'll wipe of the finger or something. We can see if his live pictures are frozen. There you go. I see changes. All good. I'll shut up. Brilliant stuff. Brilliant we'll stuff. Back in a while. 
Okay, so like as I said, I come from an educational background, so that was akin to the teacher running out of the classroom in a panic, and now I've composed myself and I've come back in to continue with the with the demonstration. So we were on to saving, and the top right hand corner you see the up arrow. Click click on that, and it brings up the different options you have for saving. Now. What I tend to do always is save a copy. So what this will mean is that you have got your original photograph in your camera roll, and your edited image then goes to the darkroom album that it, that it creates. And it allows you then to go back and re-edit from that position that, that you have done. The other great thing just to draw your attention to is that Snap, or Darkroom does a great thing in terms of hashtags. It allows you to you know, put together sets of hashtags that you may use when you're posting to, to Instagram or to Facebook. And if you come down here to the copy hashtags, it'll just have, I've got my favorite ones here that I use when I'm posting photographs to Instagram. And now what it will do is that it will save those photograph, that photograph with the hashtag. So when I go to Instagram and upload, the hashtags will be with, will be with it. Now, very often when you're shooting, that you could like shoot in one location, you're working the location, working the scene, as we learned in previous sessions that we had at the live events. And it could be that you've got a whole series of images from the same location, the lighting, the composition is all very, very similar. And in editing, you decide, you know what? I really like that edit, and I want to apply it to the next image in the sequence. And to achieve that, if you go to the top three dots here, you touch on those, you come down to the one that says copy edits. Copy the edits. Now what you're going to do now is you're going to bring in the next photograph in the series. You come over to the, 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 the reverse arrow here, tap on that, and I come down to the photograph here, bring it in. Same scene, different location, or not a different person walking into it. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tap on the three dots in the center. And now I've got the option for paste edits. And what it's done is that it has take a look from the previous photograph and applied it to this one. And again, with a touch and hold, I'm able to see what it was and what it is. Now, if I want, I can go back in and I can fine tune these edits. So it could be that, you know what, I want this one a little bit brighter or that I want to, you know, to bring the highlights down even more or maybe that, you know, I want to make the image to be a bit brighter, bring the whites up. So I'm able to fine tune it as, as I want. One of the other great things at your disposal with Darkroom is that if you look at the icons above the slider, is the far right one here, the time one. You come in here, and what it's going to do is going to show you all the edits that you did. And it can allow you to step back in the process to any stage that, that you wanted. So you can go back to as shot, and then you say, oh, you know what? I think it actually looked better with the pasted edits. So I'll take those. Again, you can copy them, you can reset it, go back, put it them on, and you've got a lot of options at your disposal um, with it. So with Darkroom, that it is really a powerful editing app, not only for photographs, also for video, as we we're saying, and that there's great options in terms of the look that you want on your photograph. If you could pull one other in here, now let's maybe pull in a landscape image. And with landscapes, what I would try to do here with this image is very, very, very much looking at the blue of the sky, looking at the clouds, looking at the texture of the snow on the mountains. And what I'd be trying to do is I would be trying to achieve more detail and more definition in those whites in the image. So what I would do is I'd come into the sliders and again, I'm going to go through the process of darkening, brightening, seeing what, what happens. And again, usually darken a little bit, maybe minus 11. Contrast, probably bring it up to get a little bit more detail and definition with it. Pinch and zoom, coming in, touching and holding, seeing that there's a little bit of difference in what we're doing. Okay. Then we come down to the clarity. Remember what clarity does? If we reduce it, it's going to be give this blurred, washed out look to it. We increase it. Let's come up here and look at the clouds and definition. We increase the clarity. We're beginning to see it a little bit more, more defined. Now highlights is where we're going to come in. And if we look here, what highlights will do in the image. If we look at the clouds here, that there's no real detail or you know, defined patterns and forms to them. Now, if we increase the highlights, we're going to actually destroy. We won't be able to see anything at all. So you see here, 
Now, it's just this white blob because we've overexposed our highlights. But if we bring the slider back and begin to re reclaim some of the information in those shadows, you can see now that we have a little bit more detail and definition in the whites of the highlights. So we brought those right back. The next one then with the shadows, okay, probably bring the shadows back a little to darken it, okay? And then with the whites, because we've got a lot of white in this, okay, we could bring it up, you see over there, bringing up the image here, making it a little pop, getting the, the sunlight behind it more prominent. Blacks, bringing them down to get more contrasty with it. Saturation, probably would leave alone. Then we're coming down with the vibrance. The vibrance could be one that we're going to work on. And you can see that with the, with the, and the temperature, so that if we increase the vibrance, we're going to increase those blues. And I'm going to over dra 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 dramatize it for demo purposes. So again, you see, this is what it was. This is what it is. Now we're beginning to get more of that lovely blue of the sky to give more balance to it. In the temperature, we can kind of, again, adding a tint to it if we get into it, but I tend to leave those alone. Look, then experiment with the fade. Does it work? A little bit of grain? No, but probably a vignette. Probably a vignette, just you know, kind of darken a little bit, bring it in. So this is what it was. This is what it is. Now, again, sometimes when you're bringing the images in, it could be that, again, you might th say, you know what? I want to take the easy way out. And snap, the dark room has got great um, filters. Let's see what the landscape ones do, OK? And it could be that you find that the actual filter is doing the job better for you. So again, it's, it's what I was saying to you. It's about personal taste and it's about getting to know your app. And it could be that you know, with a little bit of experimentation, you know that, okay, if I pull in a landscape image, those landscape filters on Darkroom are really, really good. So let's, let, let's take maybe the first one. You say, okay, but I'm gonna pull it back a little. So double tap on it and you get to reduce the intensity of it. But We'd probably leave it like that, okay? Then you're gonna prepare it for, if it's Instagram you're posting, you might wanna put a frame on it. So here, the, I think the four five would be quite good, or the five four, depending on the look that you want for, for the image. So that's it with, 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 with Darkroom. Now, for those who are working on Android, there are fewer apps available for editing images on Android. And the reason being is that when Darkroom create their app for iOS, they just need to make one version of it because it will go on to all iPhones, iPads, and, and desktops. But when an app manufacturer is creating one for Android, they need to make a version for a Huawei. They need to make a version for Pixel. They need to make a version for Motorola, for Samsung, and it becomes very, very expensive to do so. And that's why you'll find that there are fewer apps and fewer apps of good quality on Android for, for photography as there are on iOS. But probably the app which is the most popular and has the greatest functionality is the free app, Snapseed. And I love to use Snapseed as, as, as well. Now with Snapseed, it does a few other things that you'll find that Darkroom doesn't do. And I'll just demonstrate some of those here for you. Now, one of the really, really good ones that I love about Snapseed is that it has, okay, as you would expect with, with, a, with an app, it's got a lot of um, presets. Okay, it seems to have died on me there, just one second. It's got a lot of filters that you can apply to your images, but it also allows you great control over the photographs that, that you're working with. And as I'm doing this, <laughs> Murphy's Law, the app, Snapseed isn't, oh yeah, here we go. Is it opening for me? Yeah. Okay. And it's jumping the camera. All right. Okay. Okay. So open from device. Come into all my um, albums. Come into this one here. I'm going to pull in this portrait. Now, not a great portrait, but I, I like to use it to demonstrate one of the tools that Snapseed has that other apps don't have. Now, Snapseed works on iOS and also works on um, Android. So I come to Tools. And I come to the one here, which is called Selective. And Selective, you see it in the second row between Expand and Brush. Now, what I love about Selective is that you see at the bottom of the screen, you've got this plus sign. And if I tap anywhere on the screen, up pops a little circle. Now, what this is going to do is that it's going to allow me to work 
on very, very, you know, um, specific areas of my image. So because this is a portrait, I want to get the eyes. I want the eyes to be, you know, prominent and to be, you know, visually dynamic in it. So if I tap where the eyes are, you see then up pops a little uh, magnifying glass. Okay, so I got a bang in the center of the eye. Now here's what you need to correct though. For some reason, it's going to work on nearly all the image. So I need to pinch in, okay? Oh, sorry, tap it. I need to pinch in. And you see now we got this red mask and we're bringing it down and as the red mask reduces, this is just the area that's gonna work on. So because it's for the eye, let's just get it at the eye. Now, if I tap and hold, I bring up a menu. And it allows me to work on brightness, contrast, saturation, and structure. Structure is just another you know, contrast tool for detail and definition. Now, for demo purposes, I'm going to go to extremes. If I was working on this editing image, I would, I would do it with much greater care to achieve it. But I just want to show what can be achieved with a selective tool. So let's increase the brightness to 100. Let's increase the contrast so we can see it when, when, when demonstrating it. We'll increase the saturation. We'll increase the structure. Similar to Darkroom, it's got a touch and hold and release. This is what it was. This is what it is. Now you see we got a big red there now, but that's not what we, what, what we would want. We'd want it much less noticeable, okay? But for just demonstration purposes, I'm going to extremes here. Now, what's great about this tool is that it allows you to copy and paste. And because we've got two eyes, we want the same look in both eyes. Now to achieve that, I just touch on the S, and up pops a menu, I copy. Now I come down to the bottom and I've got my plus, and now I'm gonna tap on the other eye. I'm gonna to touch and hold to get my magnifying glass. And then remembering, I'm gonna reduce the area that I wanna work on. So I'm bringing it in here. And now the magic is gonna happen because if I touch the B, up pops the menu and I press paste. And the demo, this is what it was, this is what it is. Okay, so now we'd zoom in. Now this is not what we want because we got the reds and we'd have to work in it a little bit more closely, but it allows you to work in fine, small areas of an image that you want to work and to correct um, in, okay? I'll demonstrate one, of the, one or two of the other tools that Snapseed has that other apps don't have, which, which make it great. Otherwise, it's got all the range that you would expect of um, an editing tool. It's got you know, work and tune image, it's got white balance, curves, it's got a whole range of, of uh, filters. But some of the tools which I like um, from it, okay, we'll bring in another image here, are the into albums, dark room. And one of the great ones is particularly for portraits. And like we're taking one of this classic painting here. And Snapseed is a tool called Head Pose. And when you bring the tool into, into head pose, you see this little 3D uh, directional tool comes up and you can decide, you know, how you want your man to look. Do you want him head down, he looks kind of, you know, sorrowful and meek, or do I head up and he looks proud? Bring up the menu and the menu now gives you the pupil size. Increase the pupil size, okay? Touch and hold. This is what it was, this is what it is. Now the next one is where the magic starts. So you look at this guy and you're thinking, wow, man, Bloody photograph, why didn't he smile for it? Snapseed allows you to begin to make the person happier. Touch and hold, this is what it was, this is what it is. But maybe it's the opposite. The person looks too happy. Then you're gonna narrow the mouth and make them look a little bit unhappy. But let's let's give them give them a smile. Okay. Then the focal length. Sometimes at focal length, when you look at a photograph of yourself, you might think that your face looks quite flat or it might look angular. And it's a lot to do with the different focal length that, that you're using. And this just replicates what, what happens with, with it. So the head pose tool is a great one to work on with Snapseed. One of the other tools that I like in Snapseed, okay, is this one that you can use for lens blur. And where is it? 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 Oh, I didn't bring it in. Okay. Um, let's let's bring this one in instead. Okay. One of the other tools that is very, very helpful on Snapseed is that sometimes when you're looking at an image that you want to get it done in composition, but sometimes you bring it home and you realize, oh wow, I didn't notice that. Damn it, damn it. But Snapseed 
can allow you to maybe locate a part of an image that you don't want to have in it. And you're going to use the healing tool. Now, what the healing tool is, it's that it's going, just going to erase the part of the image that you want to get rid of, and you do it with a swipe with your finger. So if you look over here, we've got this, this pole in the image, and we're thinking, you know what? Don't really like that. So what we're going to do is just very, very, very quickly with our finger, we're going to run it down. Sorry. We're going to run it down. <laughs> okay, we're going to run it up. <laughs> and now I've done it without care, but this is what it was. Oh, sorry. This is what it was, and this is what it is. So the healing tool allows us to get rid of parts of an image very, very, very quickly. One other thing that Snapseed does well is the straighten tool. It's got an auto straighten tool. And if you look at rotate, brings it in, and automatically it straightened it. Now you see here, bring it out, and you'll see it more. Look at the center of the screen when I open it. So I hit on rotate, bring it in, boom. It's auto rotating the image. Um, for you. Okay, um, let me see what other ones that I want to show you with um, Snapseed before we wrap up this part of it. Okay, um, one of the other ones that you'd use maybe is for conversion to black and white, and very often with photographs. The process that I would go through would be to, I'd work a little bit on the, on the details, okay, so that there's more visual information to work with, then I'm bringing it into similar to darkroom. You've got your tune image. Okay, probably darken it a little with the contrast, increase maybe a little. Saturation, I'm gonna leave it alone. Ambience is not just another contrast tool and that, you know, that it can create more detail and definition. So we'll decrease this a little. Highlights, bring them down. Shadows, bring down. Click OK on this. Next tool I'm going to work on, this will demonstrate my process when I'm, when I'm editing. It really is um, this, this quick. Bring it into vignette, okay, depending on how much of the image that I want to darken. So darken the borders a little, maybe. Now you think because you've darkened your borders, you're going to increase your brightness in, inside. But usually I darken that a little bit as well. And then the next tool that I'm going to use is a tool called Lens Blur. You see it here at the bottom of the screen next to head pose. And what lens blur will do is that it allows you to decide what you want in focus in your image and what you want to have in terms of a grading and out of focus for the rest of the image. So because we have a central character here and that we've got these you know, people in the cafe behind, which are a little bit visually distracting, we want to keep it on attention on our guy in the front. What we can do is we can put our lens blur on this guy and then... I'm going to create the form by pulling and dragging the, 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 the radial form. So here, because we've got the guy like this, I'll probably get something like that. And you see up here, we've got a blur strength. So it means that anything that's outside the area which is in focus is going to be a blur, uh, blurred. Now you go to extremes, you see what has happened. This is what it was, this is what it is. That's probably too much. So the blur strength, probably bring down. Okay, maybe about 30 or 40. Bring up our menu, and we got a transition. And this means between the inner circle and the outer circle, how much of it is going to be blurred or not blurred. So let's bring it down a bit, perhaps. So something maybe like this, probably extend to get his shoes in, bring, bring it down a little. And now what's inside the circle is in focus. What's outside it is out of focus. And the last one then is a vignette. This, again, will just darken the borders and make the center more visually prominent. Now, with images, we go back to at the start when I was saying one of the main things that you're going to do with editing is decide, will I keep the photograph in color or will I switch to black and white? And very often that when you're shooting, like when I shot this photograph here, I pretty much knew because of the colors of his, of his clothes and with the background that I would want to get this photograph to black and white. And with the filters that are available in Snapseed with black and white, they do some, so, some quite good ones. And you have the filters presets there with darken sky, film, darken, bright, contrast, or neutral. Now, if you leave it at neutral, you bring up the menu, then you're able to, you know, to darken, bring up the contrast a little, and probably would just go with that. You also have filters, which depending on the colors, which were in the original color, 
photograph would bring up and make more prominent. I like the blue ones because it gives a little more high contrast sometimes. The yellows, but it, you know, again, it's personal choice with it. So bring it back out. This is what it is now. This is what it was. So converting to black and white. Now it's not perfect because I've gone through it quite, quite quickly. But that's the editing, working through two of my favorite editing apps. Darkroom, which is for iOS and is definitely, you know, probably the best one out there for editing on um, on iPhone, particularly because of the support that the um, designers um, have with it and the constant updates. Absolutely fantastic. Snapseed, if you're on Android and you're looking for a different option, it's free. The downside to Snapseed that I would say is that they don't update it with regularity. And the final thing I'd say about editing is that it's about personal taste. My taste is less is more, addition is dilution. You wanna make a good photograph better, but you can't make a bad photograph good. That's what I would say about editing. So good stuff. So I'll pass back to, to Glenn and Andy. That was fantastic, Brendan. Well done. We have had quite a lot of questions and a lot of conversation happening actually on YouTube. People uh, kind of sharing tips and tricks as it goes as well, which is fantastic. I'm just scrolling back up through the list because there was a good bit of interaction throughout all of that. And well done for staying calm under pressure. You know, you're a, a veteran <laughs> member at this stage, so you're well used to dealing whatever's thrown at you. Um, yeah. Elaine had asked the question about uh, deciding on the thought process, if you like, deciding between when a shot should be black and white, basically, or when it should be color. I think you've kind of touched on that now twice to some extent. So hopefully she's happy enough with the uh, the answers on that. Is there anything you want to kind of, you know, for instance, there, I thought it was interesting. You mentioned when the guy's clothes, you said that yeah. when you photograph it, it immediately dictated in your head that that would be a black and white. Is there anything else you want to tease out I about think that? Anything that when I'm trying to, trying to achieve depth and kind of distortion and kind of layered, you know, kind of w when I work with reflections and that, usually black and white will, will allow that to be achieved with better clarity, I think. But that in, in, in anything with, with um, you know, kind of harsh sunlight, I would pr pretty much know that I'm going to convert to black and white because I think that you know, to, to, you know, to, to accentuate the contrast and minimize the distractions, black and white would be the way to, to go with it like that. Very good. I'm, I'm not only going to show Elaine questions, but she did uh, some good ones there. So the, also just go back to that point in relation to when you're doing post processing, like when is too much? I think I think it's a really interesting one because I, I'm sure mm -hmm. I would when if you guys were to look at any of my images, you'd probably go that I just hacked that crap out of that. OK, yeah. but the, but the, it's it is somewhat subjective, isn't it? I mean, you know, as you say, 100 uh, percent. Yeah. Yeah. I like like photography is a very subjective thing in terms of like from the what you decide to put into the frame and to leave out of the frame. And then when you get to the editing, it is, you know, it's whatever your own personal style is. And that, you know, for some people, when they look at HDR images, they, you know, kind of are, are you know, revolted by them. Others absolutely love them. And I think that that photograph that I showed with um, India with the, the, the HDR on it, for me, is much too overprocessed. But I've had, you know, when I show that in workshops, people go, wow, what a, what a photograph. And again, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I, I, I think for, for me, like, it's that with an edit, I don't want that to tell the story. So, like, I don't want the you know the, the colors, the vibrancy to be jumping off the off the, off the screen for it. Pair it back, and and you know, if you I find that if I'm editing an image for anything longer than two or three minutes, there's a problem with the image. Okay, very good. I, I think as well um, with the editing apps, they have all these tools, and just because they're there, it doesn't mean necessarily mean that you have to use them. Um, yeah, yeah. I I always go with the idea that less is more, uh, and it's always best better to edit to enhance rather than to edit to mask the flaws in what is uh, yeah. fundamentally a, a bad image to start with. So it, it comes back to um, always getting the right image uh, right at the time of capture. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. A uh, couple of interesting kind of comments. I'll just throw them in for the mix to pepper it as well. Anyone heard of the town, the term clown vomit for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like I hadn't, but you know, it's, you, you learn something new every day. Yeah. As well. <laughs> a few people asking if you can, if you have a raw workflow. In other words, does darkroom support raw? Yeah, so, it does. Yeah, it does. yeah, yeah, definitely. And you can, and the same with Snapseed that, but they'll both work with, with it. And also, like with the, um, the Apple Pro Raw, it'll work for that as, as well. As I, as I was saying, the great thing about Darkroom is that the constant updates, the, the app is always being improved on. And also they're, they're great that, you know, there's, there's a few times that I've had to email them with questions and they get back to you straight off. 
Jack uh, chipped in with a suggestion of his favorite editing apps. Basically, I think most of these are iOS, although obviously Snapseed gets a shout out, as you've already rightly pointed out. That's Android as well. Uh, loads of comments. You know, thanks so much for the um, for the demonstration. Several people again asking, can I edit raw and darkroom? Yes, yes, yes. This is the free version, but I wonder what's in the paid version of the app. Um, well, I'm the only one of the three of us who doesn't have the paid version of the app. So can you tell me what 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 are the bells and whistles? Well, I think that there's far more filters available. Um, I know that when you get into the, the, the portrait and um, the editing of portrait mode photographs from um, fr from Apple, there's much more that you can actually do with in terms of the, the, the depth and you know the, the tone mapping that you could have on the images like, like that. Um, other than that, it's, it's kind of hard for me to say what, 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 I, what it has because what I'm looking at is the, 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 full, the, the full model. I don't have a compare and contrast. If your phone was next to me, I'd be able to say, well, you don't have this Glenn and I do have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we probably have to do it that way. Uh, what about that one? Can you brush in local edits in Darkroom the way you can in Snapseed? I don't think that you can. I don't think that you can. And the, the brush tool in Snapseed is one of my favorite um, tools. And it is, it really, really can work, um, you know, wonders on, on images that you want to, you know, kind of for luminosity and things like that in, in, in images. Several people asking, which is your favorite, Darkroom or Snapseed? A bit of an unfair question to a certain extent. One is a sponsor and one is not. But hint, hint. Uh, but no, joking aside, um, genuinely, which, which, which is your favorite? Just to put you on the spot. I, I, I'll answer straight up and say, because I don't have the paid version. Uh, I quite like Snapseed, but it's buggy as hell. I'll just put it out. Okay. Um, it's like, I think every app will do something really, really well that other apps um, don't. I think that um, for me that... I, I like I like Darkroom a lot and I use it a lot, but I think that in in my workflow for the past maybe seven eight years it it, it has Snapseed and that um, I just think that the the range of tools like the brush and the, the healing the lens blur and and, and, and things like that are great um, in it and also I think that in, in Snapseed which Darkroom also allows you to do is that your even non destructive image so that that at any stage of the editing process you can return to it and you're not going to destroy the, the, the destroy your image. I think they're two fantastic um, editing apps, both of them, to be honest. I suppose the other thing to mention about Darkroom as well is that it's available as a Mac desktop yeah. version as well. Which you, you can't yeah. get. Here's a question now. You can clarify this one for me. If I take the subscription in the app version on my iPhone, do I get the desktop version as well, or is that a separate subscription? No, it's the I same one. Same one. Ah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's quite a big selling point. Yeah, so I've been using the... Um, I've been I've been editing on the, the the MacBook Pro here, and you know with iCloud that my, my my photographs automatically come up then when I go to Darkroom on the on the phone. So that you know kind of functionality is 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 brilliant. That if you're in the Apple ecosystem, it it makes a lot of sense to have um, you know Darkroom. And, you know, and when you think about it, and let's contrast it with you know with the likes of Adobe Lightroom or that. It is you know it is good value. It is good value. And particularly as you know, repeat myself, it's constantly being improved. Very good. Okay, so I'm just going to whip through these very fast, almost so fast I won't be able to read them, but this is the quick acknowledgement of everyone saying thanks so much, Brendan, so you're aware that so many people said um, thank you so much, thank, thank you. you so much, blah, blah, blah. There's loads of them. I could keep going, but I won't. But what I am going to do is there's a fantastic question down here, which is actually pointed at Andy. What's that? Uh... Andy, what exactly are you looking for in a competition? <laughs> Well, the judging process, um, it's going to be a group effort. Um, so once the competition closes, um, we're going to start filtering through the submissions. Um, the judging process is going to be held over a series of rounds with multiple judges assigned to multiple categories. Um, and within each round, uh, we're going to be looking at questions such as composition, the technical ability, uh, is there a storytelling element to the picture? Um, does the picture sort of connect with you? Is there emotion in there? And the photographs will be scored um, on these different criteria. So our aim is that naturally the cream of the crop will start to sort of make themselves known. And uh, that's um, what we'll sort of end up with. Uh, the results we're hoping to get out by sort of the beginning of October or so, I hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah, very good. There's uh, one more just question in relation to the competition. I will note that there's a lot of conversation going on in the chat on YouTube about specifics of the apps, which 
work away, but we we, <laughs> we could go for another hour, but let's not. Um, so I'm not going to dip in those on screen, but they're there if you want to watch back through the chat afterwards. But that's an important one, Andy. How many can you see? How, how can we sweat? I think it's the maximum is about 30. I think we capped it off at 30. I don't think anyone's submitted 30 yet, but if someone wants to. Very good. Elaine is just saying thanks so much for the transparency in relation to the judging. Uh, there was one other comment. Ah, oh, just thank you, Robin. That was very kind of you. And guys, thanks for bearing with us with the technical issues because, you know, look, yeah, yeah. you know, it's live. Trust me, anything can happen and it often does. However, so there's a few things I definitely want to do as it's the last show. The first thing is that we, well, Brendan, you know, you, you have them, so to speak. So do you want to give them away? Okay, so for the um, like Darkroom, our very um, generous sponsors have put up um, four full subscriptions to, um, to to Darkroom, and it's going to be to the first uh, first come first serve for the first so the first four in, and um, off the top of my head now I'm going to have to come up with um, a question about Darkroom. Okay, so in terms of Darkroom. And it, this is going to be a yes or no answer very, very quickly to the first four. Does, is Darkroom an editing app only for photos? Okay, well, there you have it. Is Darkroom an editing app only for photos? Yes or no answers. First in of the first four correct replies wins. While you have a minute to type a very short answer, um, I'm going to jump over to a quick uh, video. And the video basically is a little one I put together last night, which is a sample of some of the image, randomly selected, important to say that, randomly mm -hmm. selected from the entries that we have so far. I hope you enjoy this. Oh, damn it all. You know, when I put that together last night and watched it for the first time, I genuinely got goosebumps. I mean, holy crap, it just makes the whole thing worthwhile when you see the quality. <laughs> I, I mean, like, amazing. Yeah. Honestly, I still have nice, nice choice of mute soundtrack as well. Yeah, I had to get 
copyright free music, but I thought it worked well with the pieces. And I put all of them in in their original aspect ratio. No, no Ken Burns crap or any of that stuff. That's just show them <laughs> as they came in. So there you go. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we had quite a few people interacting with that one. That was hilarious. Uh, so if you looked at all the different comments, I got to go back up to the comments here and track them back. Uh, but they are time stamped just for the record and complete transparency. Um, so on my screen, just after you asked the question, uh, the answer, Brendan, was what? It was a yes or no question. It's like you could have just typed either for the crack and had a good chance of getting in. But anyway, the answer was which? No, that it's video and, um, and, and, and photos. Yeah. Okay, very good. So in order of uh, submission, I'm going to pop them up on screen now. Just take note, Andy, of, of those who got the answers right. So Joseph Gins, uh, um, um, Philip Garcia. Ira Holmes and Linda, the answer was no. Smart Phonographer, the answer was no. And the next person with the correct answer in is Rintel Nell. I, I'm just going to picture it if I try, so I'm just not even going to try. But anyway, so those are our four winners. Hopefully Andy managed to track all of those down. So we'll be in touch with you. Uh, if you actually... Let's just do this one. It's probably the best thing because last week we had to give away assets as well. And still one person hasn't contacted to get their free licenses, which tickles me somewhat. Here's how to get in contact. So if you do reach out to Andy via one of these accounts, he'll hook you up with your uh, code to unlock the full lifetime version of Darkroom, which is a very nice giveaway. And thanks to Darkroom for that. And again, a recap from last week, because uh, I know Yanni is on the stream today. Yanni, I think, was one of the winners of the LumaTouch um, codes from last week. So hopefully she's already been in contact to get that. I think um, the, the best way would probably, if they email me at support at mobiography.net. Ah, um, okay, perfect. Yeah, because if, if they're coming in in different channels, um, I could potentially miss one. So mobiography, okay. uh, support at mobiography.net. Okay, very good. Do you want to pop that into the comments maybe so that they'll see that in yeah. the chat? Well, then just to follow up. Okay, very good. Uh, you know, the gas thing, when I was watching those images, um, I and Andy... And Brenda were both involved in this a few years back as well. Twenty oh, was it twenty seven? No, twenty eighteen. The first Mojo Fest, and I did Smart Photo Fest as a bit of a rush of blood to the head as well. Um, there were some how will I phrase this tactfully or almost tactfully. There were some very interesting images that came in the submission. Like for instance, the ones that stuck out were people who just took screenshots of their phone gallery with their with their image in it and submitted that and i was just gonna you know as we wrap up the final show and as the deadline looms i was wondering are there any tips we've given lots of information on what you should do are there any tips that you'd strongly recommend people don't do when they're sending in their submissions Go. um for me um it's mobile photography competition uh, and i have seen it before um don't submit dlsr images it's um a DLSR image, although it, uh, the DSLR camera is mobile because you can walk around with it, it's not technically a mobile phone uh, image. So, On yeah, that, that how are we? How are we? Because someone's bound to ask, how are we verifying that the images are shot mobile? We will be uh, checking the finalists as we shortlist things down, uh, running through checking the uh, metadata and the EXIF. Uh, information. If we've got any queries, uh, we'll get in touch with um, the uh, artist, the photographer. Okay, very good. Brendan, any tips from you? I suppose like that when you're sending it in, make sure that you've got the orientation right. That if it is a, a portrait, that you know we don't have to turn our heads on the screen to to see what the person looks like. That that does does happen as well. Documents don't count. Oh yeah, no. wills. No. I have no wills. I remember, like, why, you know, the reason that there's a small fee is to, to make sure that people are actually genuinely interested in doing this. If it's free, you could get anything. And with Smart Photo Fest, yeah, we got photographs of documents. It's like, you know, I'm sure there's something wonderfully creative about it, but not in a competition when you look at what we just showed you. Uh, not exactly going to rise to the top, is it? Um, but anyway, yeah, so those are some top tips for things not to do. And hopefully over the five uh, episodes that we've done of the live shows, you've gotten some inspiration between Brendan and Renzo and Mark and hopefully Terry last week and then from Brendan again today. Um, it's It's been great. I've really, really enjoyed it and, you know, really appreciate everyone that has joined us for the live streams and born with our wonderful technical challenges over the over the five <laughs> episodes. Um, but, you know, it is live, as I say, that that's what happens. Um, any final thoughts, guys, before we wrap up and say bye bye? Yeah, like I think for me, Glenn, I suppose that, that when we started our planning for this um, a long time ago now, that, 
you know, we had no idea what kind of entries would come into the competition. But seeing that video there, I think, has been absolutely very re rewarding for us because I think we, 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 the three of us come from, you know, we're all photographers. We're doing this for, for, for other photographers because we wanted to showcase the work that has been done on mobile. But we also wanted to put learning at the center so that everybody could, you know, improve and that get something from it and build a community. So I think that in that instance, you know, just in that regard alone, to see those images that are coming in, people tuning into the live events, Big thanks. It's been a fantastic experience. Excellent. Very good stuff. So, I mean, Andy, any parting thoughts you want to share before we wrap up the last one? No, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with uh, Brendan there. It's, it's been a long road to put this together. It's been quite stressful. It's been a lot of work. Uh, but these live shows, I think, have um, just set the awards apart from other competitions. Uh, it's just given a, a value back to the community. I, I, it's been great. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm wrong by saying this is the last one because this is not actually the last one. The last one, just so we're clear, the last one will be after we've announced the winners because the plan is we'll circle back and we'll try and get all the winners together for a, a, a bigger show, if you like, to a certain extent where we'll get to meet the actual winners, have a chat with them about their journey, their inspiration and a bit of background from their images. And we'll showcase those images again in another presentation. So there's one more to look forward to. We just can't tell you exactly when that's going to be because obviously we need to go through the whole judging thing as Andy's already outlined. So all that's ahead of us. But if you have stuck with us over the last, um, what I guess has been the best part of three months at this stage, uh, thank you so much. Really hope you did get something into the competition. If so, look forward to seeing your work and wish you the very, very best with it. Um, but we're an hour and 20 minutes into today's live stream. So I think uh -oh. we might just call it a shot now. <laughs> uh, but it's been a pleasure. Uh, all these videos will be available for playback, obviously, as they have been on the Mobiography YouTube channel. So please do, if you want to go back over details, for instance, of stuff that Brendan covered or stuff that Terry covered last week, whatever it is, they're all there for playback as well. And again, if you have questions, I've put up the email address there for Andy, but you can reach out to any of us. Um, we have uh, mo mo our social accounts are on our on screen right now. So please do do that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so we will be back. We just don't quite know when, but it will be soon. Uh, we're going to say ballpark five, possibly six weeks time in and around there. But do keep an eye on the Mobiography uh, accounts on Twitter and Instagram, because you'll probably hear it first there. Um, but yeah, so from us, bye-bye um, yep. for now. Bye-bye. Over now. Okay. Get your entries in.